Welcome to another moment in the Word. I'm so happy to be back with you again, and I apologize for the long time that we have been apart. There have been a lot of things that have happened in my own life, and maybe that's true of you too, including a move of my offices and even a fire in my old office. And so it has been a number of things, but your life is like that too. It's never smooth. There's always challenges, and those challenges are opportunities for us to depend on God and to grow in His grace, and the same has been true. I have been so blessed. I have others that have joined me, Jim particularly, that has been a blessing to me, and I hope you have others that are a blessing to you, and we hope now that we're a blessing to you as you meditate with us. We're in Acts, we're in chapter 9, and we're looking at verses uh, 10 through 12. And the question is, how is uh, your life being used in the life of someone else by God's grace? How is God using you? Or how have others who are godly been used to uh, change you and, and improve you, to exhort you in the Lord. How's that happened? Well, what we're seeing is in verse 10, it says there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord in a vision said, Ananias. And he said, behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, arise. And go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prays, and hath been, has seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive sight. Oh, it's so interesting. What is uh, happened, what has happened in Saul's life, remember that Shuel in the Hebrew, what changed him? In chapter 7, we had that incredible sermon by Stephen. There was nothing wrong with it. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It gives the history of Israel and how God providentially had worked in the nation of Israel. You would have thought that would have brought Saul, Shual, to know Messiah, but it didn't. Sometimes God works incrementally, step by step, here a little, there a little, precept upon precept. And sometimes that's the way in your life. Then there is a sermon that you may hear, or a scripture you may read, and that may really stir you and you may be affected, but not changed. And then Saul is on his way to Damascus to extinguish the Christians. He is convinced that Christianity, Jesus Christ, is actually an anomaly, something that needs to be destroyed, something that's a sect, a heresy that needs to be extinguished. And so consequently, he's not satisfied with killing the Christians that are in, in uh, Jerusalem. Remember, he was breathing even threats and death, and he pursues them as far as Damascus. He's on the Damascus road. And while he's on the Damascus road, he sees this blazing glory of light. And that light then has a voice. And much like God speaking through a burning bush, God had spoken through that blazing glory to now Saul and said, why do you persecute me? Saul is blinded. And he's blind now for three days. And isn't that not a parable of what actually had happened in his life, that the God of his age had blinded him? He's thinking that he's actually speaking and doing things which are of God, but in reality they are not. They're actually of the Satan himself. And so consequently he's blinded. And now we have, and it's at this very time, and that's the way it is actually worded in the Greek, verse 10, that there is now, at this moment, a certain disciple, and his name is Ananias. He's in Damascus. 
It's important to understand these words. Anytime you see a word in the in scripture, remember, not one yud or tittle is going to pass away. Even the letters and the formation of the letters, and certainly names, they all have meaning. Look them up. And we find that the name of Damascus, it's, it's a really interesting name. It, it, it literally means the beginning of salvation. It's a turning point. And that's literally how it is changed. It's a turning point. It was the very place, the first time it's mentioned in Scripture is back in Genesis where Abraham pursues the five kings from Sodom and he goes as far as Damascus. It's a turning point. And is there a turning point in your life? Is there a point in which you look at your life and you say, this is the time, this is the place in which I was confronted by Messiah, I was confronted by the Holy Spirit, and my life was changed? That's what's happened to Saul. His life will never be the same. In fact, life will begin at this point because of what happens in Damascus. And so he is there in Damascus and he runs into this man that is named Ananias. However, God is the one that is actually bringing about this rendezvous, this meeting, this, this uh, intersection. And, and, and Ananias, what's his name mean? Well, it means Yah is gracious. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Ananias, and you may remember the Ananias that was the high priest during the time of, of our Lord's uh, uh, trial. In fact, of the seven trials, the first one was with Ananias. God uses even the wicked to praise him. And his name means grace. God uses grace even in the circumstances that are so seemingly abhorrent to us. God is at work. God's not frustrated. His word is not limited. And his Holy Spirit is greater than all of the demons and the horde of Satan. Oh, God is gracious. And that's what Ananias is here. Ananias is going to be used of God at this place called the turning point, the beginning of salvation. And it was to him the Lord came in a vision. Now, what is a vision? We find that it is young men will have dreams and old men will have visions. The book of Revelation is a vision. John is 96 years old. It's a vision. And what is a dream and what is a vision? Well, a dream occurs while you're asleep and a vision occurs while you're awake. John responds and we have in a vision, we have John asking a question. Who can open the scroll? Or he weeps. Or he even falls down as one dead. Are you aware that God is speaking and he can speak to you even while you're awake? You don't have to be asleep. And that we find that God is speaking to us all the time. It's so important that we're aware and that we acknowledge him in all our ways and he'll direct our paths. Even in your life, at this moment, wherever you are, you may think you're alone, but you're not. His spirit is speaking. And we find that he came to him a vision, and he said, Ananias. He just simply said his name. And maybe that's what's happened, much like Mary, Mary. And she turned around and recognized it was the Lord. Do you recognize when God calls her name? Yeah, that's what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice. They will follow me. Well, he says, ego, not ego of me. Ego of me means I am. Oh, he just simply says ego. That means I. I, Lord. And that is the response. Are you av available to him? Much like Isaiah in chapter six. Here am I, send me. Well, what happens? The Lord's not done talking with him. Verse 11, he said unto him, arise. In other words, whatever you're doing, you're going to be doing something different. God's going to call you. Arise and go. And literally, it is in the passive. This is interesting. While you're going, you're to be, you're led. 
You're not, while you think it's your feet, your hands, your action, your behavior, your thinking, it's true, but it's passive. It, it means that God is doing the leading. Are you following him or are you leaning on your own understanding? Well, then we find that he says, go, go to the street that is called straight. Well, straight is the very same word that is used back in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 3, or in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3, and that is make straight the way, make smooth the path for Messiah. The, the word straight literally means direct. In other words, it's where you literally level the mountains and you raise the valleys. You're to make a direct uh, obedience to what God has called you. And when he's called you, you're to be immediately obedient. <coughs> Are you? Are you being direct with the Lord? Are you straight with him? Well, he's to go to that place, and he's to inquire, and it's in the house. Now, when you would think, okay, this is rather simple. No, it's not. We, we know that Damascus is a very, very large city. In fact, it's the capital city. <coughs> and, and because it is such a large city, he would need to be directed by the Holy Spirit. And, and he's told where to go. It's in the house of Judas. Oh, this is so interesting, isn't it? Where you, it's almost, you can't but smile at God's humor and providence. That it was, when we find Annas, Ananias that was mentioned earlier, he was the high priest who judged against Jesus. And when we think of Judas, we think of the one who was also the disciple that betrayed Jesus. But God is no respecter of persons. He's using this man and he looking at his name means praise. And that's what is it, it is. It's in praise that people come to know Messiah. Is there the joy in your life that causes people to want to come to your house and, and to learn about Messiah? Well, you're to go to the house of Judas and you're to ask about Saul of Tarshish. Now, the, the, Saul is the same person, and he is well known. And all of the Christians at this period of time, they had great angst about Paul because Saul was somebody that was persecuting and murdering Christians. And it wasn't just Stephen. There was lots of Christians. And so consequently, he's told to be calling for Saul of Tarshish. Now, what is Tarshish? Tarshish is the capital of Cilicia, and it means, like you have a metatarsus, it means the place of joining. It is the ankle. It is what connects the leg to the foot, and that is what is going on here. There is a connection. There are seven bones that connect the leg to the foot, that metatarsus. Saw is in the place of connection. God is using you to bring about a connection between someone that doesn't know the Lord or perhaps knows the Lord, but out of the fellowship of the Lord, or maybe a believer that needs to be encouraged and strengthened in the Lord, and you. Do you see how God is weaving the tapestry of your thread with somebody else's and that we're not really alone, that God is using this and orchestrating this? And so he says, behold, he's praying. It's in the present tense. He's praying now. Remember that he had been fasting in prayer, not, re not eating, but he had devoted himself entirely to prayer. Now the word prayer is in the middle. And that means that while you're praying, you may think it's your words, your thoughts, your speaking. But in reality, if you're really praying, it's where God is working and you're receiving and you're speaking back what he is directing you. And then we find in verse 12, 
and he hath seen a vision. So now we have a double vision. We have a vision that Ananias has, and now he is being told that Saul had a vision. God's bringing this whole thing to happen, and he's doing it in your life. And he's seen a vision, and he saw a man by the name of Ananias. In other words, Ananias is being told, Saul is expecting you. He's expecting you by name. And he's expecting you to be coming, and that's what it is. Coming and putting his hand on him because he is blind and he needs sight. He has a need. And God could have healed Saul without Ananias. But no, he doesn't do that. He uses people like you, people like me, people like Ananias to bring about his healing. And that's how it is, isn't it? Is it that you're experiencing in your life someone else sent by God to bring healing in your life and maybe even salvation? Or are you aware that you are being used today to minister to someone else. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for your word and for how precious it is that we realize that it is you that's moving in us, through us, and often for the benefit of others. But Father, we are grateful. You've used others to benefit us in worshiping and serving you. In Jesus' holy name, amen.